Hello, everybody. I'm John Dorhauer. I am the General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ, and it is my honor uh, to welcome all of you to this panel of Latinx speakers in this, our Welcoming Week celebration of the Global Cleveland organization. The United Church of Christ proudly sponsors Welcoming Week with Global Cleveland, and it is my honor to introduce our first speaker, Representative Jesus Chuy Garcia. U.S. Representative Jesus Garcia proudly represents the 4th Congressional District of Illinois. He was sworn into office on January 3rd, 2019. Congressman Garcia was born in Las Pinos, a small village in the Mexico state of Durango. He is the youngest of four children raised by his mother while his father worked in the U.S. And in 1965, Congressman Garcia and his family immigrated to the United States with permanent resident status. Congressman Garcia fights to improve the lives of his working class neighbors, many of whom are themselves immigrants just like him. He's a coalition builder committed to empowering youth and expanding access to quality education affordable housing, and economic opportunity. He currently serves as a member of the Influential Financial Services Committee, as well as the Natural Resources Committee and the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Congressman Garcia has been an activist since college when he began organizing for workers' rights and more inclusive city services. He was elected committee man of the Cook County Democratic Party in 1984 and quickly earned recognition as a coalition builder between Chicago's Latino and African American communities. He was then elected to the Chicago City Council, later to the Illinois Senate, uh, State Senate, ran for mayor of Chicago in 2015, and was on the Cook County Board of Commissioners before being elected to Congress in 2018. Some of Congressman Garcia's influential legislation have been ending Cook County's cooperation with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, ICE, the first of any of its kind in the nation, preventing non-attorney immigration practitioners from levying unreasonable fees, passing the Language Assistance Services Act, which requires hospitals and long-term care facilities to provide resources for effective communication with limited English speaking and deaf patients. And serving as a co-chair for the New Deal for Americans, which would establish the National Office of New Americans, reducing obstacles to US citizenship and support the integration of immigrants and refugees into the social, cultural, economic, and civic life of our shared nation. More importantly, Congressman Garcia still lives in the little village neighborhood of Chicago with his beloved wife, Evelyn, and his three adult children. We here at Global Cleveland are proud to welcome Congressman Garcia to introduce today's panel as both a Mexican-American and is someone willing to challenge the status quo in support of more inclusive and just policies and practices at the local, city, state, and national levels. Hello, y muy buenas tardes. I'm Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia, and I represent Illinois' 4th Congressional District. Thank you to Global Cleveland for the invitation. It's a great honor un gran honor to be part of this welcoming week, a national week of celebration that reminds us this is a nation of immigrants and newcomers, whether our families came over centuries ago or just a few years ago. Let me tell you a little bit about myself and the community I represent. As the first Mexican American in Congress from the Midwest and the representative of a predominantly Latino and immigrant district, my understanding of what it means to be an immigrant is a personal experience. You see, my story starts in Los Pinos Tepehuanes in the Mexican state of Durango. 
the t name of the town is bigger than the number of people who live in it. We didn't have much, but I lived a happy childhood along with my three older siblings and my mother. At the age of nine, we joined my father in Chicago, who was here under the Bracero program. My life changed completely. I left behind one world to come into another, but I've never lost my culture. My story is not unique, as we found a home in a Mexican community on Chicago's southwest side. Today, I'm humbled and proud to represent the same families I grew up with, mostly first and second generation immigrants. Mexicanos, Puerto Ricanos, Cubanos, Dominicanos, Ecuatorianos, Centroamericanos, Polacos. En mi distrito hay de todo. For more than 50 years, I've been living in Little Village, La Villita, the principal port of entry for Mexicans for many decades, where Mexicans and Mexican Americans comprise 77% of the neighborhood. Before and during my career in public service, I worked and led nonprofits, seeking to empower our communities from every elected office I've held. Alderman, state senator, county commissioner, and now federal representative. I've worked towards eliminating the political and racial injustices that still affect Latino communities. Right now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Latinos are the hardest hit population. In Illinois and across many states, this is a direct consequence of systemic racism. With this investment in our neighborhoods, poor education and health resources, little access to public transportation, our communities are not equipped to confront a global health crisis. From farm workers to healthcare frontliners, Latinos of all ethnicities have stepped up and kept our families fed and our country running. 2020 is a big year for us. As the largest ethnic group, Latinos will have the opportunity to make their voices heard in the 2020 census and in the presidential election. Under the Constitution, we all deserve to be counted. Con documentos o sin documentos, we so need to intensify our efforts to reach Latino communities all over the country. From today until September 30th, let's make everyone count. During this month of September, millions of us will celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. And it's also a very special year as it marks the 100th anniversary of Mexican migration to the city of Cleveland. Let's rejoice in the accomplishments, thank our previous generations that led us here, and most importantly, continue to shape our future generations as we make progress toward attaining more political power. Let's remember that we all have the unique opportunity to contribute towards change in our communities. I chose to honor my history, culture, and my future through my work in Congress. Right now, I'm working on two important pieces of legislation, the Health Equity and Accountability Act and a new way forward. The Health Equity and Accountability Act, or HEAA, which I'm sponsoring, addresses the inequitable factors that restrict access to quality and affordable health care for all in our country. A new way forward corrects the anti-immigrant and racial injustices in our immigration laws, effectively decriminalizing immigration and reestablishing due process for everyone. I also support the Dream and Promise Act, which will protect and provide a path to citizenship to millions of DACA recipients. I'm also a co-sponsor of the Farm Worker Modernization Act, that passed Congress last December and would give undocumented farm workers a path to permanent residency. I know farmers depend heavily in the state of Ohio on migrant farm workers, and we need to make sure that workers have the protections they need to work the fields. Despite the challenges immigrants and newcomers face, particularly under this administration, 
I'm hopeful because of the social movements happening right now led by young leaders. I'm hopeful because I'm part of the most diverse freshman class in the history of Congress. I'm hopeful because more and more women of color are rising to leadership positions at federal, state, and local levels. We don't have to look too far. Cleveland's very own Councilwoman Jasmine Santana was the first Latina ever elected to serve on the City Council of Cleveland. We thank her for, protect, pre, for presenting the 100th anniversary of Mexican immigration to Cleveland proclamation. And a special recognition to the City of Cleveland, Western Reserve Historical Society, and Comité Mexicano for their support of this anniversary. I'm proud to sponsor my fellow Mexicans and Mexican Americans in Northeast Ohio to celebrate this wonderful occasion and look forward to 100 more years of shared history and prosperity. Thank you for letting me be part of these celebrations. It is even more special to join you on today of all days, September 16th, Mexican Independence Day. Así que, antes de despedirme, les deseo a todos los mexicanos en Cleveland y en el país entero un feliz día. Que viva México y que viva Estados Unidos. Saludos desde Chicago. Thank you very much. Hello, buenas tardes, good afternoon, y feliz día de la independencia de México. Happy Mexican Independence Day. My name is Patrick Espinoza, and I'd like to thank Global Cleveland for giving me the opportunity to serve on this board. We have a very exciting day today, and I wanted to welcome you to today's conversation. Latinx Perspectives, now in Northeast Ohio. Today's conversation will be moderated by Nancy Mendez, Vice President of Community Impact at United Way of Greater Cleveland. Our speakers today include Daniel Restrepo, Founding and Managing Director Restrepo Strategies LLC, Special Counsel for Jones Walker LLP, on-air contributor for CNN Español, and Senior Fellow for the Center of American Progress. We also have Keisha Gonzalez, Program Officer at the Cleveland Foundation. We have Marie Galindo, People and Cultural Operations Management Executive for Margaret Wong and Associates. And we have Joel Martinez, Policy Analyst at the Centers for American Progress. I'm proud to be on the Board of Directors for Global Cleveland, who continues to push the envelope and set the temperature for inclusive change in Northeast Ohio. Today is Mexican Independence Day, and as we acknowledge and commemorate the 100th anniversary of Mexican immigrants to Cleveland, let us be grateful for today's conversation as another rope in the bridge that brings us closer together. Welcoming Week continues through Friday. Please join us for a Bavarian cooking demonstration tomorrow at noon, where Luis Hanika will be preparing a traditional Bavarian dish. Cuts, but sad. Also, tomorrow for our panel, Advocacy, Allyship, Alliance, Cleveland's African-American community leaders and African immigrant leaders. That discussion will take place from 10 to 11 a.m. And please join us afterwards for a Congolese cooking demonstration at noon and a musical performance by Janice Liu at 6 p.m. You can register for all these events at www.globalcleveland.com under the events section. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to Nancy Mendez. Have a wonderful time. Hi, everybody. And just one thing, I apologize uh, so much. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Pastor Reverend uh, Dr. Dorauer. And of course, thank you, Congressman Garcia. Uh, we do want to thank, of course, Dan Restrepo, Mario Galindo, and of course, our awesome Nancy Mendez. And we couldn't do this without Keisha Gonzalez and Joel Martinez. We also want to take a quick second and thank all of our sponsors, uh, the Margaret Wong and Associates Law Firm, Dave's Supermarket, Destination Cleveland, the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, the NRP Group, Medical Mutual, Eli's Landscaping, the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, Dealer Tire, Cuyahoga County Board of Development with Disabilities, the Catanese Classic Seafood Company, Bank of America, United Church of Christ, Marcus Thomas Cleveland Cavaliers, the City of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, the City Visitor Guide, our Downtown Cleveland Alliance, and WKYC Studios. Thank you all so very much. Happy Welcoming Week. Happy Latino, Latinx, Hispanic Heritage Month. Now to our fantastic moderator, Nancy Mendez.
Sorry, I was just taking a second to unmute myself. Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to learn about Latinx perceptions from both Northeast Ohio and national points of view. This is especially important as we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month and the 100th year of Mexican immigration to Cleveland. What does it mean to be Latinx in Cleveland and in America today? How can we create more opportunities for the Latinx perspective in public policy, funding opportunities, media, and more? We will, dis we will discuss these topics with our panel. I would like to introduce our panelists, beginning with Maria Elena Galindo. Maria was born in Mexico City and came to Cleveland as a young child with her family. She's a graduate of Universidad Autónoma de México Law School. She has devoted herself to educating Hispanics and non-Hispanics about the beauty and diversity of Hispanic cultures through present presentations, seminars, and multicultural marketing. A recognized expert in Hispanic issues, she has frequently presented on syndicated television and radio programs. Keisha Gonzalez joined the Cleveland Foundation in June 2018 as a program officer for community revitalization and engagement. Keisha brings six years of dynamic placemaking experience. Prior, prior to joining the foundation, Keisha served the Stockyard Clark Fulton and Brooklyn Center neighborhoods as the managing director of Metro West Community Development Organization. Keisha earned a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from our very own CSU and went to earn her Master's of Arts in Historic Preservation from the University of Delaware. Joel Martinez is a Mexico policy analyst for the National Security of International Policy team at the Center for American Progress, CAP. Martinez received his master's degree from the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego, where he focused on international politics and economic development within Latin America. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in Latin America and Latino studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Dan Restrepo is the senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. For ne nearly six years and through two presidential campaigns, Dan served as the principal advisor to President Barack Obama on issues related to Latin America, the Caribbean, and Canada, serving as special assistant to the president and senior director for Western um, Hemisphere Affairs at the National Security Council from 2009 to 2012 and as an advisor to a surrogate for Obama for America during the 2008-2012 campaigns, plus a whole bunch more. Uh, but I wanna get back uh, to, to, to the panelists um, and get going on some of the questions. Um, let's just get started with an opening statement from each of you. And if we could st uh, start with uh, Mari, that would be great. Thank you. and. Um, um, Definitely honored to be here. I am not an expert, and although I am called one, I am here to learn from all of you, and what a wonderful opportunity to do so. And um, as Nancy had said, I am Mexican-born. I was raised in Cleveland, and then went back to college in Mexico, thinking of staying there. Then my mother decided to open a small chain of Mexican restaurants, and I came back and became her marketing director um, at her little chain. And uh, what I am hoping that we get from this wonderful panel is that we really tackle those difficult questions that we face in our own communities among ourselves um, you know many people believe that us mexicans are always the immigrant when in fact for thousands of years we have been part of the texas and new mexico and nevada and colorado for thousands of years and one day we were part of uh, uh, Mexico, and one day we were, uh, and of course Spain, and the next we were Mexicans, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Americans. So we do have Mexican Americans that go back 10 generations to the USA. We have participated in every war, including the Civil War. The valor that our um, armed forces have shown for Mexicans, it's incredible. Uh, we have participated in everything. We have astronauts, we have people in science, we have wonderful, wonderful professors and teachers, business people that are, you know, are just coming in. We have a long history. We are the old timers and the newcomers to the USA. And uh, my mother, American born um, from Illinois, from actually DePue, um, Illinois, uh, went back to Mexico after the Mexican Revolution. Well, not she, but her mother took her back to Mexico, but she is an American. And she really taught us the love for both countries. And I believe that uh, my 10 siblings and myself are truly um, 
bilingual and bicultural. We feel very comfortable and we came from a place of privilege in Mexico and we have remained a person, people of privilege here. That doesn't mean that I am not aware and cognizant of everything that every person can go through, especially in this day and age when everybody's suffering with this COVID. But because we are talking about the Latino experience and having been the past CEO and um, executive director of the Hispanic Cultural Center, I really got to know the incredible diversity and beauty of every Latino nationality. So everywhere I went as a, the CEO of the Hispanic Cultural Center, I very proudly became that nationality that I was representing at that time. And I was honored to do so and humble because um, I am not, I was not, you know, I am Mexican, but um, right now we are facing some very challenging times. And I do hope that we tackle those extremely difficult uh, questions that we have so that we can move forward as a Latino force. And of course, also as individuals, as Mexicans, as Cubanos, as Puerto Ricans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And immigration is really something that is, um, I work for an immigration um, firm now, and that is um, something that's very dear to my heart right now. Thank, Thank you. you, Maria. Uh, can uh, Keisha, would, can we have your opening statement, please? Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I am, beyond being at the Cleveland Foundation, um, I am more importantly, uh, born and raised in the Clark Fulton neighborhood, which is Ohio's densest Latinx population. Um, and it has been quite honestly, one of the most forming um, components of my life that influences how I approach my work today. Right. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation, really holding the intricacies and the complexities of what the Latino Latinx Latina identity really is not only locally, but at a national scale. Because um, I think like everything we are, we're forming, we're transforming, and we're actually entering, in my opinion, a whole new wave of, of, of solidarity, of closeness and alignment um, that's going to come into a really beautiful convergence, um, I think, as we continue to push forward um, and not only serving our communities, but finding ways to build partnerships with other communities like our Asian American Pacific Islanders and the Black community in Cleveland. Thank you. Joel. Thank you, Nancy, uh, for moderating this panel and to Global Cleveland for the invitation to participate and for putting this together. Um, as already mentioned, my name is Joe Martinez and I'm a second generation Mexican-American currently based in DC, but originally from California. And for me, being a Latino from California, from California means being from a state with long established uh, Hispanic Latinx roots and with significant um, Hispanic Latinx political power today. Uh, for example, my home state has the highest Hispanic Latinx population in the country with over 15 million people. It has the largest Hispanic Latinx eligible border population in the country with almost 8 million people. It has the highest immigrant eligible border population in the country uh, with just over 5 million naturalized citizens, Mexicans being their largest share. Um, and the purchasing power of the Hispanic Latinx community in California is among the highest in the nation. Latino owned businesses employ almost half a million people in the state. And our community contributes significantly to local, state, and federal taxes. But I wanted to take a step back and have a broad look at what it means to be um, Hispanic Latinx in the U.S. today. 18% um, of the U.S. population is Hispanic Latinx, making it the second largest racial ethnic group in the country after white non-Hispanics. That's nearly 61 million people. The Hispanic Latinx community has played a significant role in driving the U.S. population growth over the last decade. From 2010 to 2019, the U.S. population increased by nearly 19 million people. The Hispanic Latinx community made up more than half of that, with almost 10 million people. At the same time, with the median age of 30, Hispanic Latinx are among the youngest racial ethnic groups in the country. Also, traditionally, the Hispanic Latinx population has been concentrated in the West, Midwest, Northeast, and in the South of Florida. But in the last 10 years, it was actually in the South as a region that experienced the biggest Latino population growth, particularly in states like Georgia and North Carolina, where 20 years ago, you wouldn't, you wouldn't find much of our community there, but now there are over a million Hispanic Latinx in each. And lastly, 32 million Hispanic Latinx are projected to be eligible voters in this November's election, making it the second largest racial ethnic group, again, after white non-Hispanics. And 
from a big picture perspective, this means that to be Hispanic Latinx in the US today is to be part of the second largest um, racial ethnic group in the country, be part of more than half of the total US population growth in the last 10 years, be among the youngest racial ethnic groups in the country, part of a community that is geographically spread out throughout the United States, and a community that is projected to be um, the second largest racial ethnic group of eligible voters in this election. Thank you, Joel. Last but not least, uh, I'd like to introduce Dan. Thank you very much, Nancy, and, and thank you for cutting short my biography earlier, because the longer you went, the older I feel. So it, uh, <laughs> it, it, wor it worked out well. A lot of uh, great stuff, Dan. <laughs> uh, and, and, and want to reiterate thanks to, to Global Cleveland um, and to you for, uh, for moderating this panel and, and for pulling us together today to talk about this. Um, this kind of vitally important topic. And, and I think we're going to go deeply into a bunch of the issues that have been touched already by, by Madi and by Keisha and by Joel. But I just kind of wanted to start by making an observation that I, that I think gets lost. And it ties in a little bit in terms of what uh, Madi said. Um, so Latinos are a part of this country and we've been a part of this country since before its inception. Um, and, and I think that's super important to think about and, and to reflect deeply on. Um, because the, the, the kind of, there's a common narrative uh, when looking at the Latino population in the United States from, from outside the population to attempt to other Latinos, to attempt to, to separate Latinos out as something different and something not American. Um, there is no group who's more profoundly American. There are others who are as profoundly American, but there's no group that is more profoundly American than Latinos. Um, and the, the multi-generational history that uh, folks who, who hail from the Latin world have, have played in the history of this country, I think often gets lost uh, in part because it, it played a great, our communities played a greater role um, in, in the history kind of west of the Mississippi um, and, and history is still very much told east of the Mississippi in the United States um, in, in ways that quite frankly um, complicate our own understanding of who we are as a country and what we aspire to be as a country. And the other point I want to make is, is that aspirational question. Um, I think the, the Latino community today or the Latino communities today um, find ourselves in a really interesting um, place uh, in, in, in the body politic of the United States. Um, in many ways, the guardian of the American ideal, um, not the lived experience, not the, uh, because the, the, the lived experience in the United States falls well short of the ideal uh, of our nation and the idea of America. But I don't think any group better, it better captures um, the American ideal and stands up for its fundamental um, aspects um, than do um, kind of Latinos and other quote unquote marginalized communities. Um, the, 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 the aspiration of America, a, a land where anything is possible um, and where anyone can be someone um, is something that's lived day in and day out um, quite frankly, not by the dominant culture, uh, the historically dominant culture in the United States, um, but rather the aspirational cultures of the United States. Um, and with Latinos being a fundamental part of that coalition. Um, and that idea, the American ideal itself is in question today. Um, and the future of the American ideal and of the aspiration to be what we can be is in question today. I mean, in question in a way that it has seldom been in the history of the Republic. Um, I am actually quite optimistic at the end of the day that the American ideal will prevail, um, but it's going to prevail uh, not because of the powers that be. Uh, it's going to prevail because of the powers that are coming. Um, and the powers that are coming, um, importantly, among that coalition uh, of the traditionally excluded, um, but the, 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 the holders of the American ideal, um, are those of us in the Latino community um, and the Latino communities all across our country. Um, and the experiences that we all bring to bear on what this country is today, but much more importantly, what this country can be tomorrow, um, if it better embodies and better captures um, the, the work, the ideals, uh, and the determination um, to build a better tomorrow that you find throughout uh, Latino communities and have found throughout Latino communities throughout the history of the United States. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there and looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Dan. Um, let's begin by expanding on uh, a, a topic that all of you touched upon in your opening, and that's identity. Um, identity within the Hispanic, Latino, Latinx community is complex, ever evolving and impacted by history of co colonization, 
uh, that many of us have used very, various different identities in speaking about ourselves, whether it's Chicano, Boricua, Latino, Hispanic, again, Latinx. So my question to um, all of you is, can you discuss your, uh, your identity and how you define yourself um, and, and, and maybe talk a little bit about uh, the uh, in, intersectionality of the Latino experience in discussing your identities? I guess I'll start. Um, <laughs> so I want to lead this conversation at the table that like identity moves with time and it moves with you. It's changing. Um, I don't think, I, I think that if we, if we sit and we talk about any sort of identity, right. Um, and, and assume that it is, it is monolithic. It is, it, it's a big mistake. And I think it's a hindrance to us moving forward as, as a people, us moving forward um, as community. Um, so I, I really want to lead with that. Um, as I think about today and where my personal journey has really brought me around identity, um, I've definitely elevated to the forefront, um, really being Latinx first and foremost, as someone who was born and raised in the U.S. Um, with a real close alignment with really identifying it as a Boricua, as a Puerto Rican. Um, and third, being American, right? Um, because I think my cultural dynamics, right? The nuances of my day to day, the things I elevate my mannerisms. I talk with my hands all the time, right? Like these sorts of things that we learn and we're enculturated into, those impact my day, my day to day significantly more um, than all the other components of identity that come behind it, right? And, and I think we see that, we're seeing that resonate significantly more today than I have ever seen um, across professional sectors. Um, when we look at the ecosystem in Cleveland um, around how folks are, are associating with identity and, and within the Latinx, Hispanic, Latino um, context, folks are bringing those nuances to the forefront and they're bringing themselves, they're bringing their whole selves to them, to the workplace and to the body of work and influencing it in a way that's been really transformative. And from my reflection, has moved bodies of work 10 times faster than generations before. Right, and I, think, and I think that's really, really important for us to think about and consider. Um, I think very often we've, and I say this as someone who was taught this, right? Um, to change your way and your being so that they don't think other of you, right? And I, have, I started my career, right, thinking that I have to conform to the spaces of which I'm entering, and that wasn't very fruitful. Um, so as I've found myself and ground myself more and more in identity and who I am and bringing it to the forefront as an asset, right, as something that is marketable, something that should be monetized, um, that for me has been like, I mean, my work has, I feel more rewarded in my work and I feel like the outputs of the work have been multiplied over and over again with how it has community benefit. You know, so uh, this, this nuance around identity, I think it's going to be a beautiful thing to watch real closely over the next five years. Because like more and more folks are bringing, bringing their class experience, bringing um, the nuances of, of being born and raised in the hood are actually being celebrated more and more in particular with the intersection of culture, right? Because I think that that is the key, that is the insight when we're talking about the type of work that the community found, you know, uh, the Cleveland Foundation funds, for example, right? Or the type of work um, that we think about when we ask our nonprofits to really understand community. It's about allowing those practitioners to bring their whole selves and bring their whole identities uh, to influence that body of work. Um, you know, so I, I could go on and on. I, I wanna make sure that, you know, we can all capture that. But yeah, like leading, leading with that freedom of identity um, and the intersectionality of it, I think is going to be, could be key in transforming the next five years of work, in particular in Cleveland. Anyone else want to jump in? Um, and just a quick reminder, we had a couple folks raising their hand and we will, uh, if we could just please wait till the Q&A session to ask your questions. With that, um, anyone else would like to jump in? Well, um, go ahead, Joel, please. Thank you. Um, so from my personal experience, um, I was born in California, um, the son of immigrant parents from Mexico. Um, English is my second language. And I was also raised in Mexico for some, um, for some years as a child. And uh, once being back in California, I grew up in an immigrant household that had uh, still strong ties to Mexico. And given California's history with Mexican heritage and the significant presence of the Mexican community there, my identity growing up was either Mexican-American or Chicano. 
Um, and I feel comfortable with the thought of belonging to two different countries and my identity reflected that. Um, I, of course, was aware of the broader Hispanic Latinx community in the U.S., but I didn't really put much thought behind identifying in a, in a broader term. Um, it wasn't until I left California and moved to the East Coast that I started identifying as a, um, a Latino, mainly because that heavy presence of Mexican identity was no longer around me. And I was around other folks from Latin America and the Caribbean that obviously did not identify as Chicano or Chicana. And even though uh, my preferred way to identify is still as a Mexican American, I am comfortable identifying now as a Latino from California of Mexican heritage. But that for me was um, an evolving process over time. Mari? I know You're you can mute. see my mouth move, but yeah. you can't hear me. I'm hoping to add some value to what uh, both Kish and Joel has, and everybody has shared. Um, one of the things that um, I often talk about is the fact that I flew into the USA and the fact that I did not have to cross the border, that I did not have uh, any problems becoming, um, uh, having a legal status because of my American born mother. And uh, that does not take away from what I need to do and what I was taught by my parents as paying forward. When we first moved to the USA, my, my grandfather had already been here, um, coming from um, Denver to Depew, Illinois, to Cleveland, Ohio in, in the 1920s. And one of the first things that he was asked was, uh, will you move your grandchildren that are moving to the USA after my dad passed um, to Cleveland? And he said, oh, absolutely not. That's not their environment. So we did have that uh, kind of attitude that, as Joel has said and Keisha has said, you evolve and you grow up and, and I hope you become a better person. And knowing that we moved to a, a Lily White neighborhood we went to lily white schools we just felt very comfortable because it really mimicked what we had in mexico but as my world grew and i started uh, volunteering and doing quite a few things i started volunteering as a 14 year old in the hispanic catholic church so i used to travel and it was wonderful that my mother never stopped me or said it's dangerous that's a dangerous neighborhood you don't want this. those are not your people as a matter of fact she said we are all of our people and it is your duty and your responsibility to to actually help out and pay forward because i didn't think it happened to any of us which is true and uh she went on to like i said open a small chain of restaurants and i do remember that um she passed at 97. She opened her first restaurant at 62, and she worked until she was 87. When she passed at 97, we did a celebration of life. And she's indigenous. She's Mexican indigenous, with my father being a white Mexican. And we were very much attuned to our indigenous roots, and we were so proud of um, her love of earth and everything that she taught us. And in her celebration of life, we were very pleasantly surprised of so many people coming, whether it was ex-employees or people that she was helping and always uh, donating money to so many causes. And it had, it, they didn't always have to be Hispanic, uh, but there was, of course, that love towards um, Hispanic uh, community. And so many people telling me, you know, your mother helped me buy a house. Your mother paid for my son's and daughter's education, college. Uh, your mother got me my green card. Your mother did this and your mother did that. And I just remember this very short, dark-skinned, beautiful angel sitting by the kitchen because she used to cook for all of her 11 restaurants since 4 o'clock in the morning. And how quiet she was because she never, ever told us all the things that she was doing. Money to her was a means of paying forward. And that taught me how fortunate I have always been, but it doesn't take um, anything away from feeling for my fellow people, my Mexicans, my Latinos, and anybody um, who is not at the table and getting all the opportunities that we need to have at the table. So just the fact that I have been partaking at the table uh, with wonderful uh, jobs and wonderful opportunities, it doesn't mean that everybody else is. So I do like to be that, uh, hope, hopefully, that person that will uplift anybody. Because as Keisha says, we, we find wonderful people everywhere, everywhere. And um, it's not where you live but, or where you come from, but what you do with what you have. Dan. Yeah, so, so a couple, one kind of one personal quick thought and then one kind of macro thought on this. Um, 
and as Keisha said, like identity is 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 an evolving concept, and I think it's I think that's true for each of us as individuals, as I think we just heard from from my three fellow panelists. Um, and it's and it's true more broadly. Uh, and, and for me, it's been a function of of almost misidentity rather than identity. Uh, and, and what do I mean by that? So I grew up about as far from the hood as you can get. Um, I grew up in an incredibly privileged um, world. Um, immigrant parents. My father was born and raised in Colombia. My mom was born and raised in Spain. My oldest siblings were born in Colombia. Um, I'm one of two siblings who was born here in the United States in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I grew up and, and, and but there was always something kind of slightly off and it was language uh, or slightly different or differentiating. And for me, it was language. Um, so I grew up speaking. I, I, I never know how to answer the question of did I, what's the first language you spoke because I spoke English and Spanish together. Um, and, and they're both of my first languages. Um, but we would speak them and we would speak both of them in public um, in Northern Virginia and in the DC area in, you know, in the 1970s and early 1980s when there weren't a whole lot of Spanish speakers in, in DC in the DC area. Um, and there was always that kind of like that odd look. Um, and as a kid, it, it didn't really, it didn't, it, it didn't otherwise impact me. It registered, but it didn't otherwise impact me. But interestingly, I think language has been my vehicle to the misidentity. Um, I, I, there, there are more stories than I care to tell of um, non-Latino colleagues, work colleagues over the years, um, saying to me words to the effect, because I do a lot of Spanish language media uh, and have in, in, in different guises over the course of the last decade and a half, two decades really. Um, and in one story, just exemplary of it, like one day I was on my way to work with two colleagues and I was describing that I had to get back to the office because I had to do a, a Univision or an Univision interview. And this colleague of mine looks at me and goes, oh man, how embarrassing that we have, you know, a white guy doing the Spanish language media for us. And I'm like, well, um, not as embarrassing when you stop and think that the white guy is a Latino. Um, and like, like, really? I'm like, Restrepo, I always thought that was Italian. So I, which is a constant refrain, like Restrepo, or Restrepo is as Colombian a last name as you can possibly get in, on the planet, really. But Restrepo's are only from one part of Colombia. Um, but so it's that misidentity dynamic that I think has always been kind of interesting for me to, to, to wrestle with and that language in some way is um, the vehicle by which it has manifested itself. And, um, and like Keisha, as you guys can tell, I talk with my hands as well. Um, but, it, it, but going from the, the personal to the, to the broader thing, I think one of the really interesting things that has happened um, among Latino communities, and, and Joel kind of got to this, and Joel kind of, um, it, for Joel it happened moving from the West Coast to the East Coast, um, which is an enormous psychological dislocation, if nothing else. Um, and <laughs> because it, it, Washington's a very different place um, from just about anywhere. Um, like all capital cities, it's very different um, than, it, than the country it, it, that it is the capital of. Um, it, one of the interesting dynamics of, uh, in this kind of pan-Hispanic, pan-Latino, Latinx, the, the, the mere notion of this broader identity um, that we are all part of, um, regardless of kind of which version of the hyphenation we are, right? Whether we are Puerto Rican or Mexican American or Colombian Spanish American in my case. Um, it, but it, the interesting thing is it's very much a phenomenon of the last decade, decade and a half in the United States um, in terms of uh, folks with Latino backgrounds identifying as Latino or Latinx or Hispanic. Um, and it's largely been a defensive mechanism. It has largely been that the othering that I talked about earlier, the kind of systematic othering, um, you know, some, some use Mexican quite broadly in public discourse these days. Um, one person in particular, when he's talking about Mexico and Mexicans, isn't just talking about Mexico and Mexicans, we're all Mexicans. Um, in, in, and, but the notion of Latino became this kind of collective identity as a protective mechanism, as a, if you're coming after any of us, you're coming after all of us. Uh, which has been this really interesting evolution um, because it used to be, and there's still a great deal of differentiation among the different Latino communities, but there's that now commonality, uh, kind of a commonality by necessity um, to say, wait a minute, you, you're not going to other us, you're not going to divide us out, you're not going to, you're not going to exploit differences while you're coming after us. 
um, and this, there's, there's grown up of, over the course of the last, particularly the last 15 years, um, this, this pan identity. Um, and there's a bunch of power in that pan identity. Um, and I think kind of untapped power so far. Um, I think we're only beginning to see the edges of, of what can be done by kind of leveraging what was a defensive mechanism um, into something much more creative. Thank want you so much, Dan. Oh, oh, sorry, Nancy. Go right oh, ahead. I want to build off a little bit because like that, it, it reminds me a lot of, you know, uh, uh, some of the conversations I've been having in particular with, you know, I'm a millennial, right? With other, other, other millennial Latinos. <laughs> this embodiment of the collective Latino identity also allows for people to deal with this reckoning we're having around our, our individual identity at a very like personal spiritual level. Um, I'm going to get a little meta in this, right? But like, I think some of the things that we have to really think about is that some of us are really starting to figure out that like, because history has been not necessarily delivered in the most honest context to us, um, that we're, we're starting to hear things about our ancestral narratives that um, we see injustices and in how we've had identity imposed on us. Mm -hmm. So like in the ways of which we have to identify from a federal context, all the way to how we have to identify in an educational context, right? So I, I think there is something really um, powerful in, in, the, in the construct of, of Latino, Latina, Latinx, um, that allows for the individual to deal with that internal reckoning, right? To deal with um, the deconstruction of ancestral trauma, to deal with, the, with what it means for an individual to either decolonize or to have, um, some sort of understanding of what the impl implement implement uh, implications, I can't English, <laughs> <laughs> which seems the appropriate panel for that to happen. Right. <laughs> the implications of, of, of how history impacted our families, you know, some of us are significantly um, more span, you know, more, more Spanish than, than others, right? Some of us are significantly more indigenous and we see this spectrum, right? In, in, in with our own nuclear families. Um, and I think there is something to be said around kind of just like the power to deal with that and to deconstruct that and to digest it, right? Because I think as a people, we also have to talk about the issues around colorism, the issues around class, mm -hmm. um, yep. and the issues around who holds power from a generational context. And we see that like left and right, like in Cleveland in and of itself, right? Where power is held by who and within the constructs of what generation, right? And, and as we move forward as a whole, um, having these really open and honest conversations, which will be difficult, right? Um, is gonna be really, really uh, important to honor and celebrate that, indi that individual reckoning within the constructs of those conversations. Thank you for adding that, Keisha. I, I, listening to all of you, uh, we've all have our own experiences and I can tell you one thing that I've learned is to try to be very uh, um, sure of who I, I, how I see myself in my own identity because as someone who also uh, was born in a small town of from Puerto Rico called South Bronx, New York, uh, then um, growing up in uh, uh, Clark Fulton, um, going to uh, elite boarding school and and uh, and and a almost predominantly white college in Massachusetts, living for a while in St. Thomas, my identity had to be very secure because it depending on where I lived and who looked at me, they they had their own identity trying to impose it on me. So it really does, uh, um, all of your comments really spoke to me. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna move on to the next uh, uh, question here. And um, because we have so many, uh, most of you are, uh, work for institutions and um, for government and for foundations. So um, knowing about your background and, and, and uh, the different influences that you've had at the tables that you sat on, do you see a role for institutions and foundations in creating positive change in the Latinx community? Yes. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to keep it high level. Um, I know like we're cogn being cognizant of time. Um, one, of an, one of the things that is so important is not necessarily about the creation of opportunity, but for the autonomy to have, the, for, for the autonomy to self-define what the needs are and what the opportunity is, right? I think institutions, I think that governments and all of these complexes of which we need to operate in 
um, need to take a step back and let people self-define solutions, right? And this goes across the board. This could be for Latinos. This could be for, you know, our, our Black brothers and sisters. This could be um, for refugee populations, right? We really need to have a conversation about stopping, listening, packaging the saviorship, right? And put it in a box to the left and saying, what is the solution that you need, right? And how do we support that? And how do we perhaps either provide you with the tools to meet that solution or say, how do we help you build those tools and infrastructure on the way? Um, and I'll leave it at that because the answer is yes, we have a role, but it's not, it's not us defining what those solutions are. It, it, and the role also, it, I think the answer is absolutely yes. And I agree with what Keisha just said. Um, I think one of the ways that what Keisha just said actually happens in the world um, is making sure that um, those who are making decisions are reflective of um, the broader context. Um, and and, and the, you know, the, the tired cliche of, of a seat at the table. Uh, but I think it's a really important concept that I think institutions and organizations today more than ever have an affirmative responsibility um, to ensure that they at all levels um, look and spend like the communities that they act in um, and that they exist in and the ecosystems that they exist in. Um, and that's a place that's like fun we are fundamentally falling short um, where institutions still very much reflect um, what I hope will soon be the past power structures of this country. Um, and that's true kind of throughout. I think that, that, that is true. I mean, there are certain sectors that are, are more representative and more um, inclusive of the ecosystems in which they operate. Um, but, we're, but kind of fundamentally, we're really short on that still. Um, and I think there's a real need, and this, and this again speaks to this notion from the Latino, from the Latino perspective that um, there are Latinos who do everything. Right, they, like you, you can't find you, you can't find an area of leadership or expertise where there aren't Latinos available to lead an an expert, um, and it's the notion of opening those spaces, um, and and this is where the there's fr from our communities there has to be kind of a demand signal, but there really has to be a recognition um, from from those in places of power. Um, that they've got to relinquish power and they got to do it affirmatively, right? It's, it's not opening up new spaces and opening up kind of segmented off spaces. It's about fundamentally and affirmatively stepping back. Um, and that people um, in, in privileged positions have to relinquish some of that privilege. Like, and, and they have to do it in a very conscious way. Um, and there are plenty of people to take up that privilege. There are plenty of people to occupy those spaces and as a collective move us forward in a much more constructive way. So absolutely institutions and organizations have that, but their privileged leadership need to, as part of their way forward, understand that they have to step back. So I'm going to uh, change things up a little bit because we had a question come up that I'd like Joel to answer from the national perspective and Mari to answer uh, from the Cleveland perspective, if, if, if possible. The question is, we seem to be forgetting the experience of the recent immigrant and first generation immigrant in this conversation. Some of us still don't even understand what it means to be Latino, Hispanic or Latinx because we identify with our countries. Uh, and the question just went, uh, countries of origin. Um, so they wanna talk about how they can be included uh, um, into the whole conversation of identity. Yes. Um, so sort of referencing back to what I mentioned earlier, um, I'm a second generation um, son of immigrant parents and I identify as a Mexican American, but there is this sort of understanding that the farther you are in generations, you the less you identify with either yours or your, your parents' country of origin, and you start to sort of gain that more of a of a broader American identity and you feel like you don't you don't need to label yourself as being from a certain racial or ethnic group. Um, for some is um, a lot easier than others, um, especially when you're white passing. 
um, for those that are not white passing, um, it is sort of not, it's definitely not that easy to just say, I'm an American, no matter what you say, because the other person looking at you is saying, well, you don't really look like it. So yes, um, I believe when you, if, you're, if you're either a first generation or recent um, immigrant in the US, you can be part of that conversation of the broader um, sort of Latinidad. Um, and you don't, you don't have to feel sort of that you don't belong to that because even within those second, third, fourth generations, like, you know, it's like we are ourselves like struggling also with that, like almost like an identity crisis. But at the end of the day, um, we have the Hispanic Latinx community in general to fall back on. Um, and strength is in numbers, you know, and I mean, again, 32 million project projected that um, Hispanic Latinx are, are going to be voting in this November um, election. That's significant political power that um, it's not only for the U.S. born, but also for those foreign born folks um, that are included within our community. Well, um, coming to Cleveland um, as a 10 year old, we were uh, raised to not only love this country and honor the USA, but definitely honor our beautiful, beautiful language, which is a second language to Mexico, of course, um, Spanish, since my mother did not speak an indigenous language. And so we grew up feeling like we own the world and we're bilingual and we are Spanish speakers and we're very proud and uh, we own this land because my mother was indigenous. I mean, those are the things that we grew up with that everywhere we went, we were just like, move out of my way because, you know, uh, I'm, I'm here. And they gave me a lot of um, support because it came from the family. And as, as like I said, as I started growing out and noticing that not everybody felt like that and uh, participating in uh, the Cleveland Art Museum panels, et cetera, I noticed that I was usually the, other, the only Latina there. And I started asking why we're we not inviting other people. And I realized, you know, your, your um, upbringing of privilege has really somehow uh, cut ties to what the reality is of all of us, of anybody, whether it's an African Latino, an Hispanic Latino, a white Latino, etc. And I started learning so much. So here in Cleveland, not only did I have a very strong family support, uh, but also the Mexican community that came in Cleveland and they opened the Azteca Club to help the Mexicans that were coming here uh, to work, uh, gave me a wonderful foundation to understand, okay, so how do we open the doors to everybody? Because not everybody feels welcome. Not everybody feels that uh, we have a seat at the table. And I started to talking to people and I do remember um, I had a teaching job and I actually traveled to Puerto Rico to learn the Puerto Rican culture because I knew nothing about the Puerto Rican culture. Most of my students were Puerto Rican from low income uh, background in the near uh, West side. And that really fueled, I think, my advocacy for opening the doors for everybody. One of the first jobs that I had after graduating from college was working for McDonald and Company, which is a Lily, which was at that time investments, Lily White. And that is the first time that somebody actually questioned, what was I doing at a company like that? What would a Mexican woman know about investments? And of course, I took it as a joke, and that was the time to really push. But again, I was in a power position, in a position of power where I could hire people, where I could move forward in um letting people know not everybody's here at the table that we should be. And you'd be surprised at the depth of knowledge that we have and experience and talent and intelligence. And, um, and I could go on and on and on. So that has always been uh, my experience, my very personal experience is to always help forward in gratitude of you know, what I have learned and how I lived and um, my upbringing, et cetera. So here in Cleveland, we were very lucky as Mexicans because we had wonderful leaders with the Azteca Club and helping initiate other nonprofit organizations like the Spanish American Committee. Why? Because these Mexicans came from Texas and they were fluent in English. So they were helping the new immigrants, the newcomers from Puerto Rico, there's the US citizens, the newcomers from Puerto Rico that did not speak English. So creating these opportunities to me was such a source of pride to be a Mexican in Cleveland because I was surrounded by leaders, leaders from 
uh, Texas that knew our setters back in Texas and were now in Cleveland. And they, they were at the table and they were not quiet. One of them was Sulema Carrion, who is, you know, a true leader. Uh, Our Dolores Huerta in the Cleveland. Danny Cárdenas from Mexico, my grandfather. I remember telling us how they opened the Azteca Club and this immigrant started coming here from Hungary and Italy and um, other countries. The Azteca Club was open to furnish their homes when these families were coming from. So I think it's an unusual position to be in, to be in a city where um, these Mexicans and most of them married out into other nationalities. They did not, there, there is no Mexican community in, in Cleveland. We all um, married outside of the Mexican nationality, but that pride in, in Mexico and uh, stay with, with us. The fact is that my mother's grandchildren and great-grandchildren being born um, and raised in the USA and whose uh, you know, our husbands and wives are not Mexican. They're all bilingual. They all speak Spanish and they feel very proud of their Mexican roots. And we have made sure of that. And I never forget my mother telling me, if you are bilingual, you already have a college degree. Why? Because other people have to go to college for at least, at least at a master's level to speak the Spanish that you speak. So there was always a sense of pride. And so it's not just the family, but actually the Mexican community in Cleveland that became leaders since the 1920s with uh, people like my grandfather and all the wonderful leaders that we had um, arrived here in uh, Cleveland. So my experience has always been different. Thank you so much, panelists. Uh, it's crazy how, how fast this time went. <laughs> um, Post-COVID, uh, uh, I would love to see Dan and Joel come visit us in Cleveland. I want to recreate this panel uh, when, and uh, let's have a, a much more extended conversation because um, I do have some really good questions for both of you uh, looking at your bios as well. Um, so saying that, I just want to close by, um, again, uh, thanking our sponsors, uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers, Marcus Thomas, UCC, Dealer Tires, Bank of America, Catney's Cla Classic Seafood, Medical Mutual, Eli's Landscaping, the NRP Group, Alexander Mann Solutions, Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, the Legal Aid Society of, of Cleveland, Margaret Wong and Associates, Destination Cleveland, Downtown Cleveland. Um, we have WKYC Studios, the Cleveland Alliance, City of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, City Visitor Guide, Cuyahoga County Board of De Development Disabilities, Dave's Market. And also just another quick reminder that Friday, the, September 18th, uh, we have a couple more panels, one on advocacy, um, allyship, alliance, Cleveland's African-American community leaders and african American Im immigrant leaders from 10 to 11. We also have around the globe cooking demonstration from 12 to 1 featuring Congolese cooking. And lastly, traditional Chinese music with Janice Liu from 6 to 7. Thank you again to my panel. Thank you again to Global uh, Cleveland and have a great day. Thank you.